Our next speaker, Jack Hibblestein. I think Jack's training taught me more and still continues to teach me more uh, about what the real purpose of mediation is and how his um, understanding-based concept is something which is useful in any type of mediation, from commercial to family to uh, divorce. And I'm, I'm honored to be on the same panel with him, and uh, I think you're going to get a wonderful presentation. The other, also, I've asked Jack to talk about collaborative law, which is growing and probably uh, can use a lot of mediators in the field. Jack. Thank you, Richard. First, my apologies from Catherine Miller. At 5.15, we were having a cup of tea. She was coming over here and got a call from home that there was an illness at home. I will talk a little bit about Catherine because she's been such a valuable colleague. She was a divorce litigator. She said, I just decided I didn't want to litigate anymore. And she just stopped. And she's built an extraordinary divorce practice in mediation uh, in this model, which uh, I'll talk about and we teach together. She was originally a student, now very much a colleague and a co-teacher. She's now becoming president of the New York Collaborative Association. You've heard a lot here from what's out there in the world of mediation. Tremendous resources. And I want to change the focus from the outside to the inside, which means inside you, inside us, inside me. Because I think that's where the action is, where the, where the action starts. Why do I want to do this? What is conflict all about for me? What can I contribute? I practice as a civil rights lawyer, and I worked very closely with my colleague, Gary Friedman. We had studied together. He was a lawyer in California, I in New York, a law teacher at that time. We met at a psychological, spiritual training in which we were both students. And we would talk over the phone, and he called me up one day. He said, I just can't do this adversary work anymore. And I, someone came in and told me he wanted me to represent him in a legal dispute. And I heard a little bit, and I said, do you think the other party might be willing to sit down with you, with me, and talk about this? I don't even know what to call this, because the word mediation at that time wasn't even being used except in the labor field and the international field in some ways. And he eventually decided on mediation. And he was doing it, I was teaching, and we formed this collaboration. And he started teaching, and I started doing it. And we developed this approach, which we've called the understanding-based approach, because it's based on understanding. And now I want to take you uh, through a little bit of history here. If you look up at this slide, and it's an iceberg, and the question is, why did the Titanic sink? Assuming that the captain knew what the captain was doing, assuming that the boat was functioning well, assuming that you could see what was going on, which apparently was true at that time 100 years ago, and that's the reason that the Titanic sunk, which was what was under the iceberg. The analogy is to conflict. On the surface, oh, it's about money, $25,000, the car accident, the divorce, what does the law say? But underneath the conflict is this tremendous force that is huge in the world. It fills the newspapers, the television, every, every day with more than you could possibly read. Try to look at the front page of any newspaper, look at any television program that's not about conflict. Let's have a program just about peace. Doesn't sell a lot. Much, much, much interest and focus on conflict, and much, much conflict in the world, in families, in societies, with neighbors. There's not only conflict, but conflict runs very deep. Now through a little history of conflict resolution. One is power, power struggles, CNA, Cain and Abel. The first reported conflict, I'm told, and it was resolved by power. Cain killed Abel. 
We don't quite know what the conflict was about, but there was a dispute resolution mechanism, which happens to be, unfortunately, still the primary dispute resolution mechanism in the world. And it's deeply, deeply ingrained, and it's deeply ingrained in people who are in conflict. What do you want to do? I want him to stop what he's doing. I want to win. I want this over with. Do you understand me? That's, that's in us. That's deeply in us. A big advance, a big advance, is the traditional way of resolving conflict. And there, we have a law at the top. Thank goodness, and I mean that, not sarcastically or cynically. We have a law. If we only had mediation and there was no legal system, I think we would be in big, big trouble. We have a law, and we have judges, and here the judge is big. The judge has the power. The lawyers are pretty big, not as big as the judge, and the clients are there. So if a client, as you well know, in the courtroom says, uh, Your Honor, I please speak to your lawyer, have your lawyer speak. You, you know the whole routine. That's the way it's set up. And it's a very important system. Then we go on to arbitration. And here, the arbitrator acts as a judge. And it looks very much like the legal system, except the law is a little bit lower, maybe not the exclusive measure. And the arbitrator is not a formal judge. So the people have to agree to be bound by the arbitrator's decision, but once they're in arbitration and it's binding arbitration, then it has the power of law. So that's a somewhat less formal process. Then we come, and here are, I want to get to the differences because I think there are significant di differences. Let me go back a second and talk a little bit about how I got involved in this because this is all new development. I told you about my connection with Gary. We tried to look for how can we help people resolve disputes. I watched what Gary was doing, and then I started practicing. I was teaching at Columbia Law School, and then I left there to help found the City of University of New York Law School and held the first law conference for law teachers about mediation and tried to think about what is this all about? Is it just informal dispute resolution? Is that the goal? Just get some kind of voluntary dispute resolution, then came up all these questions. What's it going to look like? The most popular one is the caucus-based mediator, where the mediator has a lot of power, meets separately with their lawyers and the clients, or even just with the parties if there are no lawyers, and goes back and forth, what's called shuttle diplomacy. Maybe they shake hands in the beginning, at least with the mediator, and if it's successful, they shake hands, the parties with each other at the very end. But there's no talking between the parties. So here the parties are pretty small uh, in, in this picture. They don't have that much power. The mediator has the whole picture. And Gary was at a conference recently in which he was comparing the caucus method with our method. And one of the other teachers was presenting the caucus method. and it, they actually got to a pretty honest dialogue. And he said, you know what? I don't like conflict. I don't want to be around it. And so I like meeting with people privately because I don't have to watch what's going on in the conflict. And that might be true of some of you because the approach we teach, the conflict is up front person. It's right there. You might not like that. Now here is non-caucus where the parties are in the same room, but it's heavily law-based. And the mediator is really rendering sort of advice about how it should be resolved and using the law as a very significant reference point. This is our model. Back there, the mediator was still bigger than the lawyers and the, and the parties. Here, we try to make everybody the same size. And the right way to draw this, but you wouldn't see it, would be horizontally. So the mediator and the parties are on the same plane. But what we're trying to indicate is, and we say this to parties, it's your decision. It's not my decision. The trick is it's your decision together. It only works if you can find a decision that works for you and works for you, which means we have to watch for power imbalances where, well, I guess it works for me. I think, why are you hesitating?
is this process right for them? Can they each find a voice? Can there be a, a real dialogue when they can voice what's important for them? Here, the communication is not through the lawyers. It's from the mediator to the parties, the parties with each other. In the other little diagrams that we had there, the parties, the clients, were not talking to each other. Maybe the lawyers were not even talking to each other. It was all focused on the mediator, the big mediator, the big, or the judge. They might not even ever meet with each other. Here, our goal is to have communication amongst everyone. This is with the lawyers outside the room. Here, the lawyers are inside the room. And here, the arrows are all over the place, including the lawyer for party A talking with party B in the presence of the others. So our goal is to have the people working together in a framework of understanding, and that's where we called it understanding-based mediation. We originally called our organization the Center for Mediation and Law, and as understanding became more and more important, it became the Center for Understanding in Conflict, bringing understanding to conflict, trying to resolve conflict through increasing understanding. That's what we're trying to do. And this is our working definition, that it's a voluntary process in which the parties make decisions together based on their understanding of their own views, each other's views, and the reality that they face, including to the extent that they find it significant, the law. And certainly if the law restricts what they can do, they need to understand that. But the law is not above them. It's a reference point, as might be many other things in their lives, in addition to law, their relationship, their history of the conflict. How can that be a reference point? And so that's the definition that we use for mediation. This we call the V diagram. And here, usually in conflict, people move from positions to solutions. This is my position, I'm owed $50,000, and I want my $50,000. I don't owe you a cent, maybe I'll give you $5,000 to get you out of my sight, but I really don't owe you anything. That's the way people often think about it, not just in law, in many, many things. I want you to do it my way, I'm right, you're wrong. Here we try to go underneath to what's important. The, the term that's used in the field of conflict is underneath to what your interests are, what the underlying interests of the parties are. It's taken on a meaning of its own, but we just like to refer to it as what you care about, what you value, what's significant for you underlying the conflict. And we even have it taken down because for many people, conflict is a turning point of some kind. Uh, conflicts in families, I'm sure you know, can go on five years, 10 years, 30 years, generations. And to go down to really the meaning of this and the meaning of who we are as human beings as the possibility of tapping that as a way of reaching for the deeper meaning, the deeper interest, and based on that, have that guide us towards the different possibilities. What are all the ways that you could solve this conflict. $50,000, what other ways? What are the op other options? Because you'd be surprised that there often are many other possible, you're, you're not, this is not an offer. If you give an option, you can say something other than 50, that's not an offer. You're not being held to it. Let's explore together. If you can create that atmosphere of exploration together, that's the spirit in which we try to work. And this is an essential way of going under conflict to what people really, really care about. And that's not only in individual disputes. I think the potential is there. We've seen it in international disputes. Hard to realize, very hard to realize. But the possibility is sometimes there. The hope is sometimes there. And we've seen in news it being realized and then the disappointment when it disappears. Now collaborative practice. It was created by Stu Webb, who is a Minneapolis lawyer. Its development is very quick in some ways because it is teamwork, so you get to know everybody. Mediators often work alone. A collaborative, you don't work alone. Here the parties are up top, 
They're each re represented by the lawyers, but there's a basic agreement that Stu Webb created. He said, I had this idea. It was in a divorce. He was representing somebody. What if, what if I just wrote to the other lawyer or called him up, this was in 92, I think, and we agreed that we weren't going to go to court. We just agreed. We're not going to go to court. If the parties want to go to court, they can, but not with us. We will only represent them if they don't go to court. Now, it's a formal agreement. You've signed an agreement with the collaborative lawyers in the beginning. So all the incentive to beat the other guy doesn't work because you're going to have to resign. The financial incentive and other incentives of reputation, et cetera, but also the incentive from much deeper inside your own heart is how can we work this out together? How can I support my client with your client? How can we do this together? I do have a client, but we can work together in a mediation spirit together if you're willing and your client is willing and my client is willing. How can we do it together? How can we, as lawyers, do that together? And then over time, other players, down at the bottom, child specialists, coaching the people about the children, <coughs> financial specialists, and then coaches, coaching the people about conflict. But it's a team effort with trying to look at all the different dimensions of conflict. And it's almost only in divorce, but it is not limited to, to divorce. The training in this area is in how do you work in the collaborative mode. And the people sign an agreement at the very beginning that if they cannot work in this mode successfully, the lawyers will leave, they will have to hire different lawyers. So all the motivation, all the incentive is to, is to resolve the problem. There's enormous energy into this professional community of divorce lawyers with a great deal of success. And the challenge is to keep the parties foreground because there's so many darn professionals acting as coaches, advisors, etc. So the team needs to work together to say this is about those two people and their children, not just about us in our professional roles. It's easier in a way as a mediator because there's just little old me and the parties. So here there needs to be a strong effort to, to keep the parties together. Here's the definition of collaborative practice, that the team works together based on their understanding of the parties' own views, each other's views, and the reality they face without resorting to litigation or the threat of litigation. So the lawyers do not say, and they really can't say, if you don't agree, I'm going to go to court, because they have to withdraw. Now, there is the threat that the collaborative case will fall apart, but the very, very strong commitment emotionally and financially is to this process of trying to work it out together. It has enormous power, and I, I know lawyers who only work collaborative divorce and mediation full time. Barry Berkman, when he started in 93, maybe he was doing around 20% mediation. Each year it's grown and grown and grown. Barry's practice is now pretty close to 100% collaborative and mediation. And he's not alone. It's a real field. And as I said, Catherine, after she made that commitment never to litigate again and became a divorce mediator and now a collaborative professional, she couldn't handle all the cases coming to her and just hired someone else from one of our trainees to really work with her. It's a real commitment to, if you want to do it, a different way of approaching conflict. It's not the only way to be a mediator. And surely many of the big talks in, in the collaborative work is, what do we do with that lawyer over there who says he's collaborative, but did you, do you know what he does at those meetings? You know, how do we, how do we as a community try to deal with that? And there's a whole area called difficult conversations where you say, I think, Richard, could we have a difficult conversation about that case we're working on? Of course, I think, you know, Richard, you're the one. But we try to find a way to engage in the constructive dialogue. So now I want to teach you an essential step, because this is all about understanding. And it's essential to our work. And we call it the loop, because it's completing a loop. So A inquires of B, 
whatever the question is, B responds with the answer. Usually that's enough for most people and certainly for most lawyers that got the answer. Then you loop it back, what you heard. Even if it's apparent what you've heard, you say what you heard and say, do I have it right? It affirms understanding. It makes you look for understanding, and the other person feels heard. And often you don't have it right. Often there's more. Or when the person hears it back, they say, oh, yeah, you're saying it right, but I really didn't say everything that's important to me. So I want to ask you to do a five-minute exercise. And I'd like you to find one other person sitting near, near you and form a dyad. And you're each going to have about two minutes with looping. A inquires of B, B responds. A says, this is what I heard, step three. And B responds, yes or no, that you got it right. If no, then you go back to the beginning, which is not failure. And you try again. So the question, A, S, B, why do you want to work with people in conflict in a different way? What interests you about this work in mediation? And B answers any way B wants to answer. And then A loops B. So the goal is to keep it fairly short, but some people talk in clipped phrases, some people talk in sentences, a paragraph, and some people talk in chapters. You don't have to wait. You can say, let me stop you for a moment. Do I understand you so far? You're actually doing a nice thing. You're saying, I'd like to understand you. I'd like to follow you. Rather than you say, waiting for them to stop, and then you change the subject to what interests you, <laughs> which we all know about. So A, ask B, what draws you to work with people in conflict in a different way? Go for it. <laughs> See how much fun looping is? You can get totally looped on looping. OK, but now it's not over. We reverse it. We reverse it. A was looping B. Now B is loops A. The idea here is not to respond to what you heard. This is not a response. Start, and this is also important in mediation, because often people, whoever goes second, responds to what they heard. No, how do you see it? B asks A, what interests you? you about working with people in conflict in a different way. And then the looping goes the other way. One of the values of this that you realize, especially in conflict, we filter everything through our experience. To be there for them, to understand them in who they are, is an enormous challenge. That's the challenge in the world. There's something, in my view, the whole thing about mediation, it's going to go on for a long, long time. There's something happening that's very interesting about conflict. Uh, the major study of the person who is now the President of the United States at Harvard happened to be mediation. But when I started, there were no courses in mediation in law schools. It's all over the place. There's something happening about conflict in the world where we're trying, trying as humanity to find a different way to deal with conflict so that it's not on top of us, controlling us that it'll be there, but we can work through it, work through it through understanding. That's why we eventually adopted the name, the understanding-based approach to mediation. When Gary and I decided to write a book, we came up with the title, Challenging Conflict. And the reason is that I think what we're trying to do is we're trying to challenge conflict's hold over people and find a different way as a culture and as, as humanity to deal with conflict in constructive ways. Thanks. I have a question for Jack. Uh, you said that uh, collaborative law is is only really successful now in the uh, domestic. Why? Yes. Why? Yeah, I have my theory, but I happen to think it's right. A divorce usually, although some of us know the contrary, is a one transaction. You, you don't keep representing the person after the divorce. Okay, I'm still your client, I want to get another divorce, although I do know people who, <laughs> who have done that, but it's usually not the following month or the following, even the following year. So in some ways, if you're a collaborative lawyer in other areas, since you cannot litigate, you might lose the client, because I might have to refer my client to you 
and you're going to represent, they might like you better than me on all, all the matters that I have so worked so hard to develop. I've had this client for 10 years, haven't it? So I think there's a wariness among lawyers in the non-divorce single transaction mode to enter into the collaborative lawyering mode. But it, it's starting, but it's, it, it is a challenge. Please, go ahead. How do you get lawyers in the process put down their arms. What I heard is how do you get the lawyers to lay down their arms? First of all, you need to make an agreement that with the lawyers, are you willing to try to work together? This is in front of the clients to find a solution. Certainly you can put out the strength of your case, but we're looking for a solution together. If that's what your clients are seeking, are you willing to support them in that? You have to make a whole contract. It's not you just do it. And we talk about that. Would you be willing to do that? Would you be willing to do that? What would it take? And when you talk about the law, what's your view of the law? The law is, we're going to win. What about your view? He doesn't know what he's talking about. She doesn't know what she's talking about. We're going to win. If the judge were to rule against you, I know it will never happen, but if the judge were to rule against you, are you willing to say, if the other side is willing to say what the reason might be that a judge would rule against you? Don't tell me yet, but if, if that lawyer is willing to do it, would you be willing to do it? So the clients don't get this feeling, which they often get from lawyers, I'm going to win. My lawyer's convinced I'm going to win. <laughs> My lawyer's convinced I'm going to win. And, it, and the lawyers are not necessarily lying. They may well be convinced they were going to win. You get invested. What are you going to do if somebody later says, why did you let me do that? Well, in the process, we're not just going to try to move people to agreement. You're moving towards agreement. Why? And you, counsel, are moving towards agreement? Are you supporting your client in moving towards agreement? Can we talk about that? It's all very much out in the open, including what the likelihood would happen in court. But there's also, as we know, a cost of going to court, not just the financial cost of going to court, not just an emotional cost of going to court, there's that too. There's a business cost, there's a relationship cost, there's a psychic cost. So I, I think the dangers in the litigation mode, in terms of your concern, are more than in the mediation, my own view. The question is, with two unrepresented parties, and they reach an agreement, uh, to make it sure it's enforceable, who should draft that agreement? Yeah, well, first of all, there's a premise there. We close to insist that people have at least what we call consulting attorneys, especially in the divorce area, that they have somebody that they can talk to, can advise them. We prefer that the lawyers are in the room, but nothing will get signed until the way I practice and the people I know, I see Dan nodding too, until it's reviewed, the client goes to, well, I don't want to see a lawyer, we've worked this, I know you don't want to, but there are lawyers who support mediation out there, but will also advise you about your legal rights, what you could get in court that's the same as or different from, it's going to make your agreement much more solid. We don't want a year from now you to say, you know what, I went to see a lawyer and they said I should have, could have, would have, if only I had a. Uh, we want these to be fully informed decisions. And we have a list of consulting attorneys who have been through our training programs that we, that we give to people and say, these are the people who can, and you can get someone else who's not on the list, who can really be helpful in supporting you going through this, but also you're fully understanding your legal rights. The question is, with bringing all these people into the process, are the party's role being diminished in their decision making? A couple quick responses that are insufficient. One is, can you advocate with instead of advocate against? That can we really support our clients, you and I, if we're lawyers in a, in a mediation? And this is certainly the question in collaborative practice. Can we really work together? where I am primarily here with my client, but I want your client to be fully informed, advised, counseled. We're doing this together. And that's the spirit in which it's 
there's the possibility of doing that together. One of the dangers in the collaborative thing is that the lawyers are going to take over, the professional is going to take over. One of the things that we have suggested and the collaborative people are doing, can I loop your client? You know, your client's talking rather than you. Can I see if I understand what your client's saying is, and you understand what my client's saying? Not reframe it in a way, I think what your client's saying. Uh, yeah, I know what your client's saying. No, the real effort that you're going to represent your client and really try to understand her husband. And I'm representing, and really trying to understand. That's the spirit of, in collaborative, that if you could have that spirit and not be colored by your own lawyer's program or personal program about whatever conflict is, but really try to reach beyond that, which is the challenge we all have. How do we reach beyond the way conflict has us distorted? Because we all do live in a separate body. We all do come from, and that's the challenge humanity is facing, as we see every day. Thank you very much. Thank you.